So um, today's uh, uh, title of the talk is uh, "Lead Free Piezoelectric Materials," and um, you see the the whole list of uh, webinars here. So um, as you may know by now, um, these uh, webinars are part of our Innovation Hub initiative, and uh, this is uh, the fifth and last uh, webinar of, of this season. So um, I will introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Rasmus Lau Müller, our director of, uh, of research and uh, development. And uh, it's, uh, the title of his talk will be Lead Free Piezoelectric Materials, A Path Towards Commercialization. And um, we agreed that um, if you have any questions along the way, uh, uh, you can put it on the chat, chat or on the Q&A. And if I happen to see it, I, I'll just uh, interrupt and, and put the question if it fits in the context. And there'll also be room for questions in the end. So with this, uh, I will uh, give the floor to Erasmus, please. All right, uh, thank you, Erling. And um, thank you for participating in the last webinar of the year. And um, I can maybe just add that uh, we're planning on having a series of webinars uh, in the spring as well. And uh, we'll have uh, known uh, and new speakers uh, at that. So uh, you will be able to look forward to that as well. So I think we have uh, a reasonable amount of uh, participants that are uh, logged in. So I'll start by just sharing my screen here. And... Uh, This is uh, this is the overview that uh, Erling was uh, talking about, and uh, today it's about lead-free piezoelectric materials. So, uh, with no further ado, I will start uh, the webinar. Um, quick outline: so, uh, the driver of uh, the development of uh, lead-free materials is mainly from regulations and uh, the regulation in, in the question is the ROS regulation or ROS directive from, from the EU. So I'll start by uh, talking about that and then I'll talk uh, to lead free materials what's, what's out there. Uh, then I will touch on uh, strategy, meaning what's the uh, strategy of the different players or the suggested strategy of the different players in, in the market. Um, and then I'll talk about the journey towards uh, our or our journey towards uh, lead-free materials. Uh, and I'll uh, come with a, an example of a device that was uh, was made uh, at the end, and then we'll have a conclusion and, and questions. So we can start with uh, the ROS directive uh, formulated by the EU. So that came about uh, 20 years ago, approximately. Um, and uh, with update in uh, 2008, so we'll so uh, we're uh, we are at, at ROS two now. Um, it is concerning restriction of the use of certain hazardous substances substances in electric and electronic equipment, or EEE. And uh, that concerns uh, our business because we have uh, one of the substances that are explicitly mentioned in. Uh, uh, PCT, which is the piezo ceramic material that uh, obviously we manufacture and uh, our customers use in their application. And one thing to just uh, keep uh, keep in mind in, in this context that it's uh, pointing towards electronic, uh, electric and electronic equipment, um, and that's there's a definition on that. So uh, so it, it it points to manufacturers and uh, sellers uh, of of, uh, of equipment. Um, there is an exemption in place for PZT uh, because there's no replacement at present, or at least there wasn't back in 2002 for PZT. So uh, I'll go through that as well, what that means. But uh, it doesn't mean that uh, we just discovered that we can't use PZT. It's actually exempt. Um, and um, that exemption is called 7C-1 uh, at present. So what's the, what's the scope? Um, so uh, EEE 
is equipment requiring electric currents or electromagnetic fields to work. So that's kind of a broad definition. Um, so, uh, more specifically, equipment used for generation, transfer, and measurement of electric currents and fields. Uh, and there's a limited uh, limitation voltage range, uh, so 1,000 uh, volts AC and 1,500 for DC. And it can be a component or a finished uh, product. So that's the official uh, definition of what's in scope. Then there are also uh, language on what is not in scope uh, or uh, exceptions. So. Um, this is a product used for military use or essential for national security. It's a products that go into space. Um, and it's also products that are essential for products out of scope. So even though you can have a device that is not for military use, if uh, it is essential for a device that is in military use, it uh, gets the out of scope uh, brand by uh, association you can say and uh, then there are some some other uh, definitions here and i think one of the interesting ones that we always point to is uh, machinery with an onboard power source the operation of which requires either mobility or continuous or semi-continuous movement between a succession of fixed working locations while working and is available exclusively for professional use so what does that mean? It's a good question. Um, but uh, this is the kind of language that, uh, that we encounter in, in this, uh, um, this uh, directive. Uh, products for R&D uh, is also not in scope and active and uh, uh medical devices. So pacemakers, for instance. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. Then we have the exemptions that I alluded to. So uh, uh, here you see where uh, our business is exempt. So it's a state specifically or point specifically to piezo electronic devices. So in this case, we are able to use uh, uh, lead containing materials and specifically uh, PCT, which is uh, what people are thinking about in this, in this case. Okay, so uh, there are some uh, periodical updates on exemptions because uh, over time, obviously, there's an attempt to uh, try to replace PCT uh, with uh, lead-free alternatives. And every so and so often, uh, the EU is uh, looking at uh, the state of the art and uh, basically evaluating whether or not we have some uh, substitutes. So the exemptions are being evaluated uh, uh, periodically. Um, and uh, depending on the application category defined in the directive, it is uh, the period uh, is either uh, five or maximum seven years. Um, in order to give input to the uh, evaluation of that uh, update, uh, the industry has formed uh, the umbrella project, which uh, gives input uh, and uh, uh, our distinguished colleague Erling Ringer is uh, participating uh, in that since uh, 2013. We're also collaborating with the Japanese uh, electronics industry, JETA, and uh, working on uh, giving input to, to the different uh, decision makers that uh, has to, to look at this uh, from, from time to time. So uh, uh, one thing or one of those uh, uh, examples of, of an update that we're pointing to here is uh, the uh, 2015 uh, update, uh, which was the, the latest one. And uh, this is also an important one because uh, this is where we had a change in the, the language of, uh, um, of the directive. So. Uh, there was a uh, institute, Fraunhofer Institute, uh, involved in giving a, a recommendation or report on what to do with the exemptions. And they actually suggested a time limit of the exemption. And uh, back in uh, at that time, they suggested three years, uh, which effectively would have put uh, 
the deadlines at uh, 2019. So fortunately, uh, through the umbrella project, uh, we managed to uh, change uh, that decision or or amend it. So uh, so it wasn't uh, wasn't three uh, three years back then. It was in 2019, but still, we had deadlines implemented, and this is uh, this is the change that you can you can see here uh, spelled out. So. Uh, in the directive under scopes and uh, scope and dates of applicability in the old directive uh, language we had uh, nothing and in the new one implemented uh, in 2018 we have uh, actual deadlines uh, that are um, uh, that are added into the uh, directive so uh, 2021 uh, July, that's where the uh, exemptions are supposed to expire. Of course, that's a date in the past. So uh, the relevant question is what uh, what's the status and what happened since uh, those deadlines uh, expired, uh, basically. And uh, first thing to just uh, mention is that we're still allowed to use uh, PCT um, because there is a possibility to ask for a renewal request uh, so as long as that is uh, uh, supplied 18th months before expiration, um, this will be considered and uh, and the deadlines can be uh, renewed. So this was uh, submitted uh, within the timeline. And uh, then the question is, what happens now during the evaluation of uh, of that renewal request, and that was a question to the EU actually, and this is the response that we got back. So as long as there is a request for renewal, uh, the deadlines will uh, will not be um, put uh, uh, will not be put in place, and the exemptions are still there. So uh, since we haven't heard a response uh, yet from the EU on the renewal, uh, we can assume that uh, the exemptions are still there. Uh, we also got a reply that uh, you needed uh, two years to evaluate. And uh, then uh, we got some more language on what would happen in case of uh, a decline of the exemptions. So I put a timeline here uh, just to give an idea of what uh, what we're looking at. So uh, even though some of this is in the past, it's it's, it's still relevant. Uh, uh, this is the original uh, deadline for the exemptions. That was uh, July in uh, 2021. Uh, this is where the uh, submission of the request was uh, submitted. So uh, before, uh, you know, prior of 18 months before the uh, the deadline. And this is uh, the evaluation of the request that is uh, outlined here. Um, Öko Institute was engaged as well to uh, look at the uh, request and uh, formulate a report. And uh, they had a deadline September 2021. Uh, the report didn't uh, come September, but it has actually come. Uh, and we'll get back to that. But uh, Assuming that uh, the request is uh, rejected, there will be a certain amount of uh, time for the EU to uh, make a decision or implement somehow uh, the decision in uh, the directive. And then there would be a transition period um, of 12 to 18 months, meaning at the end of that, that's when the actual exemption expire where it will no longer be possible to sell uh, electronic equipment on the European market containing PCT. Okay, so what uh, actually happened and uh, where are we right now? So uh, it's still the consensus of the industry that uh, we still meet, need more research to find materials that can uh, replace PCT in devices. And uh, we did managed to get a request for extension uh, submitted to uh, the European Union. Uh, the evaluation uh, was carried out by the Öko Institute and uh, they were delayed, but we got a, a report in December, 2021. And the report uh, recommends 
in short, a uh, uh, an extension of the deadlines for, for five years. So the re recommendation right now is that uh, 2026, uh, July 2026, we will have new deadlines. And uh, this is uh, so far only the recommendation. It's not something that's been implemented, but uh, we, uh, uh, we believe that this is uh, what the EU will do. So uh, we expect the deadlines to be postponed. Okay. So what are the uh, uh, alternatives that, uh, that we're looking at and developing uh, right now? So I'll go, just run through uh, some of the uh, lead-free piezoelectric materials that, uh, that you may have heard about or that uh, exists uh, out there. Um, we have barium titanate, which is uh, something older than PCT and was one of the first uh, ceramic materials used for uh, piezoelectric applications. Um, we have uh, potassium sodium niobate, which is a, uh, um, a candidate that uh, has uh, quite good properties, but can be very difficult to, to manufacture. We have uh, lithium sodium niobate, uh, LNN, uh, and we have sodium bismuth titanate, and uh, those are um, those are uh, or, or the sodium bismuth titanate are, are a little bit easier to to manufacture. Uh, we have the bismuth uh, based uh, layer perovskite, uh, perovskite structures, which is high temperature uh, materials, and we have combinations uh, of the above. Um, so those are some of the material systems that uh, that are. Uh, being looked at, and then some of them require a little bit more uh, exotic processing techniques, such as uh, cold isostatic pressing or hot isostatic pressing. Uh, people are looking at templated grain growth, uh, um, mechanically activated synthesis, and spark plasma sintering. So we'll not go into the processes, but uh, some of these materials uh, require uh, extra processing and uh, more exotic uh, processing to really be uh, be viable. So we'll go through uh, some of the ones that uh, we've looked at in uh, uh, in Ferroperm. And uh, the one that we worked on the most is uh, the KNN family materials. It uh, it had, has pros, so we can get a fairly high piezoelectric performance. D33 is up to 250, 350 picocoulombs per newton. Uh, we have a pretty good uh, temperature range, up to 450, depending on the composition. Um, and uh, we can manufacture using conventional oxide uh, processing routes. Uh, some of the problems is that uh, the raw materials, uh, some of them are very hygroscopic and uh, it can uh, give problems with the uh, stoichiometry and sinterability, and very low reproducibility from batch to batch. Um, some of the advanced manufacturing techniques that uh, I mentioned can be used, but that, uh, um, that complicates manufacturing and uh, increased costs. And uh, then there's the problem of the sourcing of niobium, which is, uh, not only uh, expensive, but also uh, are related to some uh, health and safety issues. We have the NBT family material. So uh, this is a, a good material for high strain, high displacement uh, applications. Um, it has a relatively high mechanical uh, quality factor, at least compared to KNN. Uh, the manufacturing process is fairly simple. It uh, compares almost to piece of tea. Uh, and uh, we already have a few of those uh, compositions avail available uh, commercially. The problems are, or the uh, issues are fairly low piezoelectric uh, properties. So D33 is uh, three in the 100 to 150 picocoulomb per newtons. And, uh, relatively low depolarization temperature, 150 to 200 degrees C, depending on the, on the composition. Uh, then we have uh, the uh, BF family materials, um, which is uh, a simpler uh, composition. It has uh, potentially very high Curie temperatures. It, uh, 
can exhibit uh, high piezoelectric uh, uh, coefficients up to two to 400 uh, picocoulomb per newtons. Some of the problems are uh, the volatility of uh, bismuth during uh, the heat treatments, and it's very sensitive to changes in stoichiometry. Um, it, um, it has uh, high leakage currents, at, uh, especially at higher temperatures. So that's an issue. And it requires really high purity materials um, and a controlled environment to, to manufacture. So there's some manufacturability problems as well uh, with this material. And then the last one, which is uh, the uh, maybe most exotic and the one that uh, only just recently got on our radar is the gadolinium doped cerium oxide. Uh, potentially it has ultra high D33. So uh, uh, reports are stating 200,000 uh, picocoulomb uh, or picometers per volts. Um, but it is born electrostrictive. Uh, so you have to apply a DC bias uh, to it to get a piezoelectric. Uh, it's it's a very simple composition, not that sensitive to uh, to small changes, uh, so fairly stable. Um, but uh, it's extremely novel. Uh, very little is known about it. Uh, not all properties are well characterized, and uh, the uh, high D three three comes with a little asterisk that it's very highly frequency dependent. So. Uh, the high reported D33s are ultra low frequencies. And when you go up in uh, frequencies that are normally used in, in application, it, it uh, goes down quite rapidly. But it's an interesting material and some of those uh, problems might be addressed um, and people are working on that. Okay, so what uh, what is then the, the strategy given the environment and the materials that uh, that we have? So I try to uh, uh, suggest different scenarios that you could uh, imagine. And uh, one scenario is, of course, that uh, the exemptions that are mentioned in the ROS directive will be postponed uh, forever. And uh, that means we will be able to use PCT forever. And then obviously we will not have to do anything. So that's the do nothing scenario. Um, the other scenario is that uh, we'll find a material which has uh, very uh, similar properties to piece of tea um, and similar cost and easy to scale up. So uh, if, uh, if you believe in that, then it's just a matter to, to wait and, uh, and see and uh, hope for it to, to emerge and then react and, uh, on that. And then there's the third scenario that uh, the exemptions will be enforced and we'll have to actually use the current or similar lead-free materials that are on the market or in, uh, in the pipeline. And uh, in this scenario, we'll have to uh, start working with those materials uh, very soon. So, uh, Given those th three scenarios, uh, the do nothing, the sit and wait, and uh, uh, and the act scenario, we uh, uh, recommend the act scenario, I would say. Um, so uh, uh, just elaborating on that, the applications that we have uh, today are built around PCT. Um, and... Um, PCT has uh, the famous morphotropic uh, uh, grain boundaries, which makes it uh, stable within a wide temperature range. It has very good piezoelectric properties, uh, primary, but also secondary, such as uh, uh, mechanical comp, uh, quality factor and uh, uh, dialectic breakdown. Uh, and the entire uh, supply chain and uh, manufacturing is built around a piece of tea. Um, uh, and uh, so, so we know piece of tea, uh, we know how to make devices uh, around it. Um, do the customer uh, know how to replace piece of tea and what's important? Our indication or our uh, learning over the last few years is that they, some of them do, but uh, uh, a lot of times they they don't, uh, and uh, some of the reasons are 
that uh, there are some key material parameters that are used, but those are uh, often related to PZT. Um, and there are some secondary material properties that are also important, but is unknown, especially for uh, manufacturers. And often some of the design rules are assumed true based on, on tribal knowledge. So uh, we would like to uh, have people keep an open mind and trying the lead-free materials, even though they might seem inferior to, uh, to PZTs. So uh, we're offering candidate materials uh, at the testing stage uh, and even before upscaling so uh, customers can can test the materials uh, we're trying to build up uh, um, capabilities uh, in parallel with that and uh, of course we are um, uh, trying to uh, focus on it uh, within our organization um, so, uh, so coming back to uh, to uh, uh, the drivers for the strategy. So, I think the assumption is that uh, lead free will be a requirement, and it will be enforced at a given time, and probably before we have a drop in replacement for PCT. Uh, and we shouldn't expect any breakthrough uh, on lead free uh, materials in in the near future. So we'll have to use the known lead free compositions that uh, we went through. And uh, right now it looks like the properties are inferior, uh, at least uh, compared to lead based. Uh, we know that the processing costs at present are higher <clears throat> compared to lead based. And there we know that the cost of raw materials are higher. So, uh, so this, is, this is what we know. And uh, then for the material suppliers, such as uh, Ferroperm, the strategy will be to learn how to process uh, the known compositions using uh, raw materials and how to source them, and then offer those uh, materials on the market so customers can, can test it. Um, and we advise our customers to use the strategy to test the materials that uh, that we have and uh, work with them and learn to to know them and then give us feedback on uh, what is the direction that uh, that we should uh, put the development in um <clears throat> and then i'll circle back to uh, to the timeline again so uh, assuming we have the extensions, when is it time to, to start uh, testing and developing uh, devices? And the answer is that depends on your uh, uh, cycle time for device uh, development. But if you're looking at uh, a medical device, for instance, uh, depending on whether it's novel or it's something where you're making a design change, you have to go through different phases. Um, discovery proof of concept and and so on all the way to launch and uh, depending on uh, the device and uh, and the maturity it's it takes from one to seven years um meaning that uh, a replacement uh, of a lead containing device with a lead free may take uh, at least the three to seven years that's that's the estimate. So if we overlap that with uh, with the timeline from from the previous slides, we can see that uh, the original exemption deadline was uh, now one and a half year ago. And if we go through uh, the same steps as we did before, and look at the actual exemption inspiring, and then just uh, move that five years ahead, which is the uh, uh, recommended new deadlines um, that means mid 2028 that's when the launch date is actually for for any new devices that uh, that we have so given the development cycle time of uh, devices whether it's three or seven years it uh, it's actually um, it's not that far into the future we have to think seriously about uh, looking at that so um, I'll talk a little bit about the development uh, now inside Ferroperm and the journey towards uh, lead-free materials. So there's been uh, several activities and projects uh, throughout the year, starting back in the late uh, 
uh, 20th century in 1990s, where the first uh, high temperature piezo materials <clears throat> based on uh, carbonates were uh, were looked at in the context of uh, of this uh, company. And that wasn't specifically to get something lead free, that was to get something very high temperature, but that uh, gave, gave some learnings uh, on uh, using carbonates, which was important later for uh, the KNN materials. Uh, in the early 2000s, the watch directive was uh, implemented and the first projects uh, addressing uh, the regulations were put in place. We had uh, LEAF in uh, 2001 to 2004. We had the Minuet, Immediate, Microflex and various internal projects uh, in, uh, in that time period. Moving to the 2010s, we had... Uh, different projects as well. Uh, and uh, we also got a dedicated lead-free lab at Verpa in 2010. And uh, we started uh, some uh, more serious activities on uh, KNN uh, formulating the PZ61 composition that, uh, that we're offering. Um, and we're looking at some specific uh, devices using lead-free. So we had a project together with uh, uh, Megat in uh, Switzerland. And that was back when we belonged to Megat. Uh, we had um, an uh, uh, activity concerning piezo paint, trying to substitute uh, the lead, <coughs> lead powder in uh, piezo paint with lead free uh, uh, powder. And we had an industrial PhD working on industrializing uh, the uh, KNN process for. The purpose of uh, of uh, stabilizing the process, and then in the 2020s we started offering PZ12 and PZ12 X, which is NPT based, and uh, the latest uh, branch on the uh, lead free tree is the uh, new Canon composition that we're currently working on, which is EX62. Uh, that also shows some some promise. Um, these are the the materials that uh, we might have on offer, uh, lead, uh, lead free materials uh, compared to uh, our standard uh, hard and soft PCT, PC26 and 27. So we have uh, the uh, NBT family materials, uh, PC12 and PC12X, and then the KNN family material, PC61. And 62 is not here uh, yet, but uh, hopefully will be in the very near future. So you can see and compare the properties. I will not go into them in, in detail, but uh, of course, uh, taking a quick glance uh, down the, the list here, you see that the properties for lead free are inferior to, to the PCT based. And this is speaking to the point that I had earlier in, in the talk as well. Uh, we had some uh, customer collaborations uh, and customers looking at the materials already within these uh, application areas. So ultrasonic cleaning, uh, microfluidic ultrasound, uh, and even HIFU. Um, we had uh, imaging applications and hydrophones and uh, Doppler probes and, and the general medical imaging applications. So. Customers have been evaluating <clears throat> these materials uh, over the over the time, and uh, then I'll use the last few minutes on talking about uh, an example of a device that was made together with the Precision Acoustics, or rather, we supplied a component to Precision Acoustics, and and they made a an acoustic probe. <clears throat> so the purpose of this was to uh, uh, compare PC12 with uh, our uh, PZ26, uh, which is the standard hard material that we have, and uh, um, in in a real life application. So you see the properties here, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, the application was uh, uh, NDT, so non-destructive testing or uh, thickness gauging, uh, so an imaging application. Um, and uh, a uh, an immersion transducer was uh, was manufactured, and uh, some of the properties was measured to compare 
um, the two materials in an application. This is uh, uh, some of the properties of uh, the transducer. So uh, two megahertz uh, in, and uh, a quarter wave matching layer and uh, some of the other uh, mechanical and electrical properties that was uh, aimed at. And uh, if we can go to some results here. So this is uh, the pulse echo. Uh, measurement performed with um, with the transducers made out of the two materials and uh, a quick glance can tell you that uh, okay the pz12 uh, transducer is inferior to the pz26 um, but it's actually not that bad so uh, if you look at the the pulse generated with the two transducers, there is uh, a significant difference, but uh, it is uh, <clears throat> it is operating more or less in, in the same uh, working range. So, um, and uh, just a uh, a quick summary of, of some of the properties. So, for instance, the amplitude or the sensitivity that uh, we're able to generate with the two materials is. Uh, 250 millivolts for the PC12 transducer and 400 uh, for the PC26, which is a difference. But again, it's not uh, uh, something that uh, maybe cannot be accepted in an application or maybe uh, handled uh, with amplification. So reasonable performance for PC12, um, even though clearly there's a, uh, it's it's not a, a direct replacement. So, quick conclusion before we go to the questions. Um, there is a ROS directive banning the use of lead in electronics, and uh, that's in place. It will not uh, disappear, probably. It's, uh, it's not something that we expect, at least. Um, there are some lead-free materials based on uh, various systems available. Uh, again, with no real replacement of PCT. Um, not on the market or and not even in academia academia and the ones that are in place have inferior performance higher cost and uh, still uh, need a lot of maturation in, in, in the upscaling phase the latest on uh, the directive is that the Öko institute has uh, recommended to postpone the deadlines until july 2026 so we still have the exemptions however given the development cycle time of devices, it's not too early to start now looking at it. Um, our strategy is to try and mitigate the risk of uh, a situation where we all of a sudden are not allowed to use it, a PCT without any re restrictions. So we offer materials that we have and uh, try to uh, convince customers to, to get to know them. And uh, we just advise our customers to formulate some kind of a, a strategy um, and uh, think about whether you believe in infant postponements, wait and see, or be proactive. So I think that's the end of the talk and uh, I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much, uh, Rasmus, for this uh, very nice overview of uh, both the legislation and uh, and the materials that we are looking at. So um, I'll be uh, moderating. So if there are any uh, questions, please uh, come forward. You can put them on the chat or on the Q and A. So uh, while you are thinking about uh, possible questions, uh, let me just start. Um, I was wondering, Asmus, um, from what you said. Uh, you may be a bit disappointed about the properties of uh, of the new lead free materials. So, uh, could you say something about uh, are just all properties uh, lower for, for the lead free materials, or is it like uh, all customers really need to be prepared for for a poor performance than they were used to? Yeah. So uh, the uh, 
the, the properties uh, properties or the primary properties that we're looking at uh, in general seem to be uh, be lower but there are of course uh, properties that uh, that might be be better so the KN family materials have higher uh, curie temperature uh, or can have higher curie temperature uh, some of the um, acoustic impedance of the materials are lower than PCT and uh, that enables uh, better coupling to uh, uh, tissue organic tissue so so you can find properties that uh, that are uh, better if, if you really look at the secondary properties I think in some of the materials uh, NBT uh, can also be driven at uh, at higher voltages and higher fields um, has a higher coercive field so so maybe more stable in in some of the uh, operating modes okay so uh, you really have to to look at each material and and uh, and see uh, whether it uh, it fits or, or not yeah um so um other questions from the uh, audience otherwise uh, i may have one more uh so you were talking about um, a lot of different uh, families of, of lead free materials so uh, which one uh, or is there a single one that you imagine will will uh, really replace PCT uh, ultimately? Yeah, so the benefit of PCT is that uh, by tweaking it other, uh, either by ch changing the, uh, the stoichiometry uh, and the uh, titanium zirconium uh, fraction or by adding dopants, you can really uh, get a wide range of, uh, of material properties. So that's one of the, the big benefits. And it's not uh, as abundant on, on some of the other materials. So I think uh, the PCT will be replaced by different family materials. Um, and uh, for different applica applications, I, I think we, we have to expect that um that's that's what we're foreseeing uh, at least okay thank you so um if uh, if there are no no uh, other questions maybe let me uh, mention that um there was a, a question in the beginning from uh, from said about uh, the webinar recordings uh, are they available or will they be so uh, just uh, for those of you who we haven't heard uh, we plan to to make them available on the website uh, but uh, we will uh, notify you when when they uh, are accessible um, uh, on on the website um so i think this uh, message will come over linkedin uh, i expect okay so um i think uh, we uh, we can end this uh, webinar now so um let me say uh, thanks to Rasmus again, and uh, we will uh, wish all of you uh, our best for, for the upcoming uh, holiday season. And uh, as Rasmus said, we'll be back uh, next year with uh, some uh, exciting new uh, webinars about our field. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Erling, and uh, happy holidays to everybody. See you next year. <laughs>